We be on fire, we be lit lit. It's a unique hustle, big, big, big shit. Big shit, big shit, big shit. It's a unique hustle, nigga, big shit. Big shit, big shit, big shit. Name another podcast like this. Who gon' bring it to the table? Boss talk. Who your girlfriend favorite? Boss talk. We gon' do it how you want it. Boss talk. Yeah, everybody on it. Boss talk. It's a unique hustle. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Not none. You know, Madea Walk on. Um, I want y'all to make sure you like, subscribe, follow us on all social media platforms. I mean, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, you name it, we're on it. Even on threads. I know a lot of y'all are on threads. Y'all need to get on it so you can follow us. But anyway, if you want to see all our full length interviews, you can find that on Patreon or on our YouTube membership. So check us out. Definitely, we love the support because we bring in that content to you every single day. So, thank you in advance. Man, hey, man, we got a special guest here today, y'all. You don't need no introduction. This guy right here, man, um, hey, he a native. He from Dallas. We just so happened to be recording in Dallas, and I thought it was very, very uh, it becoming. It was a thing that we had to do. We had to get Bobby Sessions in the building. Man, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. Man, thank y'all for having me. Man, I, I, man, listen, man, man, you you dope, man. I, I I've been going through your your catalog and listening to your music and looking at what you like, what you don't like. You know what I'm saying? But and 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 I do all of that, and then I I don't know why, because I end up asking the questions through my wife anyway, because she wants to start it off with just getting to know you as a person, right? I like the childhood <laughs> so yeah. before he gets into the grown <laughs> adult. However y'all want to do it. I mean, y'all have to do it. However y'all want to do it, let's, let's So, do it. growing up in Dallas, what part of Dallas were you raised in? Uh, Pleasant Grove. What? what? The Pleasant street? Yeah. Okay. Are you serious? Not too far from here. You ain't never okay. came here before? That's crazy. I didn't know this was right here. What? It's crazy. Man, like it's I so said, crazy. God's yeah. timing is the best timing, though. That's like, hard. That's like hard, this. man. Yeah. No, you yeah. see, because where we at is so crazy because... People in Pleasant Grove don't like to come to this side because they say Springs police too terrible. That's yeah, what I've always heard. Yeah, a lot of people heard. say that. That's and we've crazy. been here, what, 16, Going 17, 17 years? years. Yeah. And we've seen kids grow up to be adults yeah. leave. Some people who went to prison came back and was like, y'all still here? Yeah. Some people went to prison. 16, 17 uh, years, that's a long time. Yeah, I commend y'all on that. And uh, uh, Taylor Gabriel went to, we can't just say went to prison. He went to the NFL, NFL. and he come back here. We used to do push-ups on the floor here. When he was a kid in high school. He, he, wow. Now he's... Got Grown. 500 homes here and helped, you know, building finances and wealth, man, and man. retired from Chicago Bears. Crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> That's wild. So, yeah, I'm originally from Pleasant Grove. I was there until I was 12, and then my family moved to uh, Rylette, Texas. To Rylette? To Rylette. So, yeah. you were raised, you say your family, so were you raised in the household with your mom and dad? Yeah, both. Awesome. So, I hit the lottery early. I know, you don't yeah. really see that a lot. But as a child, did you really know how lucky you were? Um, That's a great question. Uh, I learned how lucky I was when I got older, got but older. I knew I had a general sense that I was lucky because I would always see people shocked when they found out, like, you know, your mom and your dad, like, you know, <laughs> like how, you know, both of them, like your biological mother and father. Like, yeah, like I felt like Richie Rich growing up. Just, yeah, you know, just cause I, had, I had both of them. Like my dad would take me to the bowling alley and I would go golfing with him and all that. Like I, he, he was showing me just some different some different things and it, uh, it definitely instilled a lot of confidence in me. That's Especially good. being a junior, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah carrying yeah. that name, I took a lot of pride. I was like my first superhero, my dad and, and Michael Jordan. Mm. Wow, you know man, that's crazy, man. So, uh, did you have siblings and all that? Yeah, do you have siblings? Yeah, I have a, um, a brother and two sisters. I grew up with my brother in the house and my sisters are uh, way older. So yeah. you are the middle child or the youngest? Third. The third? Yeah. Okay, so, um, I see you say your father was a great influence on your life, but tell me exactly how did your mom impact your life as a child growing up? Uh, my mom was a hustler. Like, my mom get to it. Like, my mom, uh, they worked at, both of them went to work at like three o'clock in the morning. Uh, then she would go from there. They would go pick up shifts at American Airlines Center, mm. like pouring beer and all that for people, and then just, they was just always just on the move, like getting to it. So I think my mom is where I learned, like just the, my mom and my dad, but my mom in particular, just the just the hustle. Like she just was never, she's content and happy with what she has, but mm -hmm. the work ethic was always just to get to it. I love that, yeah. and you saw that, and it, that 
that's part of you right now. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. awesome. Like sit, when you see people that just decide that they're going to wake up when everybody else goes to sleep because they didn't want like regular nine to five shifts. So their shifts was like three to uh, like noon or three to one or something like that. And they was just they just got to it mm -hmm. while everybody else yeah. was asleep. And they did it to create a better life for, for y'all because Absolutely. you said that you were in Pleasant Grove. A lot of times when I think about Pleasant Grove, um, because I'm not from here, but when people talk about Pleasant Grove, it, it, talk about a hood, you know, like Pleasant yeah. Grove is the hood. Yeah. And then here you moved out of that and went to Raleigh. And when people think about Raleigh, that's like the nicer area. Yeah. So when you think about how much they worked, they were trying to get you, in my mind, out of that environment to a better environment yeah. so y'all to prosper a little bit better. That definitely was the, the thinking behind their hustle. Like they um they was looking at houses when I was like five years old, like but just like plotting and plotting to get mm. put themselves in position. So I was in Pleasant Grove right off of um Jim Miller Road. Mm -hmm. Like I stayed in the, the Buckner Terrace neighborhood. Like that's where we stayed at. Well, first I, we was in uh, was it like Sky Place Apartments. Then we went to the Buckner Terrace neighborhood. Our house was like a couple streets by Skyline High School. I went to Edna Row Elementary. And in, in my mind, I was going to be in Pleasant Grove the whole time. Mm. I was president of the school by the time I left. <laughs> and then they're like, yo, we moving to Rolette. And I was like, what the fuck is Rolette? I didn't say that. You know what I'm right, saying? Like that. But right. in my head, my kid brain, I'm like, what the like, fuck what is, is Rolette? That? And um, I didn't know nothing about Rolette. I never heard of Rolette a day in my life. And it was... um. It was a big culture shock. I was about to say. Uh, it was a crazy culture shock. Like, Did you get in fights? No, nah, I didn't get in fights. It was just, I wasn't used to seeing that many white people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like that. Just yeah. just going from seeing basically all black people Blacks to and a, a lot of white people. It was mm -hmm. a lot. Now, where I went, it was still a lot of black people because it's just going, you know, 15, 20 minutes up the road. But mm -hmm. it was just different. Yeah, it was just different. Yeah, and I, I get it, man. Like like Dallas, people that realize when they say Dallas, they think of one dimension. You know that. Yeah. They don't think of all the different dimensions of Dallas, the rural areas, and just the you Raleigh and Rockwall, Rockwall Garland. being in Garland, and then you yeah. got like that side over there, totally different. You hit in the Frisco and Little Lamb, you start, but you still that's the surrounding areas. People just say mm -hmm. Dallas, but man, just just to see. Um, just how you, you basically were able to maneuver. How did you end up getting into music or did you know mm -hmm. early on that you was a, you know, a musician? So I knew early on I was good at rapping, but I didn't see myself like as a musician or artist or nothing like that. Like I was always good at freestyle. I would freestyle in the back of the car and all of that kind of stuff while, when I would be at my, uh, my friend's house or would be in their backyard and somebody beat on the table. That's when like the grinding beat by the clips was like crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do, 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 do. Like yeah. that was like the craziest yeah. stuff ever. Yeah, um, I'll take a pen and just, just go crazy on the desk and annoying the teacher and all that. Like I knew, <laughs> I felt I was naturally better at that than everybody else that Bring I was Bring that mic over a little bit. Yeah, I yes, felt I was um, naturally better at that than, than most people, but I was playing sports. I was running track, playing basketball, playing football. And by the time I got into uh, maybe my junior year of high school, I had just did, I was just doing football. And I was realizing like on the bus and then the locker room, that was my game. Wow. That was the, that was the time where I was like you were the guy. Yeah, You know what I'm saying? And it, it didn't take no effort. I didn't have to put in a lot of work to be good at rap. Like it was just, it just came natural. And then I just kept getting more and more competitive and competitive with it. And by the time I got to college, I had like, I went to um, UNT, University yeah, of North yeah, Texas. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, they had a, um, <coughs> a student organization called Poetic Justice. Oh, really? Um, yeah, so it's every Tuesday night in, in, uh, in the gazebo in front of the student union. They would have like poets, rappers, uh, singers, instrumentalists, or whatever, they would stand in this circle at this gazebo. One person goes in the middle and they like just get their shit off or whatever. So I was doing poetry and stuff at the time. So I did a, I did a poem and then they did a, free, a cipher at the end and I'm listening to them. I'm like, I feel like I rap better than these people. So I went to my dorm. I wrote like my first rap. I came back the next, it was November 16th, 2010. You I remember went, the date? I remember the date, because that's also the day I met my wife. Wow. That was all the same day, all the same wow. night. And uh, I went and uh, I did this rap. Place went crazy. I'm like, this is what I'm doing. So you killed it? Oh, man, bodied it. So what, what gave you the, 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 I guess, the, the, the courage to get up and do it? 
because in some way, shape, or form, whether it's playing sports or whether it was, I've, I'm used to having to perform in front of a crowd. Okay. Like for a decade before <laughs> before I got to that moment. Man. So it's like I had always been on the stage or in some kind of capacity in front of people. So. What did what was give me give me a lyric or something that was in that rhyme? Can you remember that? Yeah, um, I remember the line that got my wife's attention. I, one of the lines I don't remember what I rhymed it with, but one of the lines was. Try, trying to see me is like a blind man staring through a peephole. Oh yeah, I was rapping that like my first week rapping. Wow, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> and it was like, ah oh, man, this nigga crazy, bro. They loved it. So you see, people just start showing up every Tuesday to hear like what I was gonna say, say next. next, and um, then I'm like, man, I need to, and then at and then at that time, I heard that's when like Kendrick Lamar was like starting to get hot, and I heard a song from him called um, "The Heart Part Two. And he was going so crazy, and I was like, if I don't drop out of school, I don't know how I'm ever gonna catch this guy. Yeah, wow. So that's what made me drop out of school. And when you dropped out, I'm, okay, when you dropped out, what do you feel like things start to happen for you at that point? Uh, Yes and no. Like, so, yes, things was happening. Like, I started performing out here in Deep Ellum. Yeah, like, yeah, for April sure. April 2011. So I started putting in work like I was out here like every weekend, Friday, Saturday, like performing, doing free shows. And we started getting like bigger and bigger shows, but I wasn't making any money. Yeah. So it was just all free shows, free shows. But just being young, like a teenager, I'm like, I'm so dope. I'm finna make a million dollars from this shit. Like, and it wasn't coming. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't coming. So it was having you, you like every entrepreneur, everybody that decides that they're going to bet on themselves you reach a point where you have a vision in your head that you're following but your physical reality people are not seeing the progress people measure progress based on how much money you're making and things of that nature and that wasn't visible in the beginning so um so to some people looking at my situation it didn't seem like things were happening but i always knew things was happening like it was i wasn't doing shows now i'm doing shows i wasn't getting paid at all now i'm getting paid some whether it's 50 dollars or 100 dollars or something so in my mind i'm seeing incremental progress uh and i just stuck to that that vision but for you to dive like you did i think that's extraordinary to just say, you know what, I'm diving, I'm going for it. I got to do this. This is my passion. And how supportive was your family when you dropped out? Uh, it wasn't supportive in the very beginning because it was out of the blue. They hadn't really seen me rapping all that before. They just knew. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom, she, she going to laugh when she see this. She used to say before um, before I enrolled in school, she was just like, nigga, don't be playing with my money. Like That was like a thing. She was just drilling my head and be playing with my money. That's me. So now I'm dropping out of school. I'm not going to none of my classes. And we and me and her, we both got different like fast for loans and all this and and you know when you get straight f's they accelerate when you need to <laughs> when you need to pay them loans and she's like bro you couldn't even go to class and i'm just like mom i can't da -da -da. and i uh i apologize to her later because it was just it was it seemed very impulsive and, and now that i got uh now that i got a daughter i'm just imagining if i know this person a certain way for 18 years and, and then change, all of a sudden like, I'm, you'll be like what the fuck uh so uh <laughs> so no, nah, they wasn't they wasn't Receptive as supportive in the beginning. <laughs> to it at all. But I don't blame them because that that shit looked crazy. I get it. You know what I'm saying? It looked crazy, and you want your you want uh you want your kids to be what you deem is safe. So y'all yeah. been working and putting all these sacrifices. We started off in an apartment to Pleasant Grove to a one story house in Pleasant Grove to a two story house in Rolette. You made all these sacrifices. <laughs> Trying to get you to see a vision. For me to dr drop out to say I'm rapping and you ain't seen me rap for real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When so, was the first time that that, that they seen you? And, and, and I'm gonna stay on that for a second. Just yeah. when did they see you and they recognized that you had a talent? So, okay, so, so I said, dropped out 2011. So. I was doing so bad, like financially. <laughs> you wasn't smoking weed, was you? Oh, what? Stop. Oh, on. shit. Man, what? <laughs> Man, can this nigga crazy? <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> no, nah, it looked crazy. It looked crazy. No, nah, I was getting high all the time. Like, I, I was in a perpetual state of being high. 
<laughs> like all the way inside. And you go rap. But I was I was going in, but it looked bad. You it looked with, bad to I see kids doing it now. That's what's funny about yeah. it. And but I was smoking in high school and all that too. Like it didn't stop it, them, but it just But it looked worse when you done dropped out of college and you just hanging around right. and you ain't working. smoking was you working? Back A's. Yeah, I was working. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, different. Yeah. Was you working. working. But it's still I'm taking all my money and putting it back into the, this shit. Like yeah, so I was the music. I uh, I worked at um, Walmart. Yeah, I worked at um, a call center, and then uh, my last job I worked at the post office um, in Oak Cliff, and um, and I was trying to get like some stability to get my shit going or whatever. And at this time, I started listening to a, a lot of um, like books and like the personal development, yeah, self help yeah. kind of stuff, like the Alchemist, Think and Grow Rich. Yeah, uh, really as a man, think of yeah. um, mm-hmm. like I, all, like literally, I got obsessed with that whole world, and I decided that's what I was gonna make my music about, like helping people hold on to that vision, that's helping hard. people to take the weeds out of their mind and that all the negative. You. Man, what it transformed? It transformed my you. entire mind, and that's hard too. And, um, so I decided, like, all right, this is my chance right now while I'm young and I still got the energy. Like, these jobs going to be here. Like, I need to go for this, like, right now. So I had put in my two weeks notice. So my last day working a job was December 31st, 2014. Wow. So when you, you what, what, where, where did the, the light come in at? So I put out, it was a song called um, Black America. I dropped it on, like, MLK Day, and I ended up booking a show at Trees in a venue in Deep Ellum around January, the end of January 2015, and my parents came to that show, and that was the first time they saw me like performing raps. And then when they saw me on stage, it clicked. That's the first time? That was the first time. And they, and they, was, and they was proud of you? Yeah, everything clicked then. And um, so shortly after, I meet J-Dot. Okay. My manager, J-Dot. Who now he owns high standards that has Coco Jones, Lady. Yeah, Bunker. yeah, y'all got a hell of a roster. I uh, appreciate it, man. Like, so I was like the first signing of high standards. Really? Like the first one, yeah. And um he heard this Black America song and he was like, Yo, I got this this vision, this thing called high standards. He was like, There's no I, there's no magic red button that I'ma press and you gonna go from here to here. It's gonna take some work, but if you buy into this vision, you're gonna get where you need to go because I hear something special in you. So I ended up signing with High Standards in uh, October 2015. Wow. So less than a year after I left my job, I signed a record deal. Wow. And then it, that makes it even more real for your family and all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, so my mom then started, when I threw, I started throwing my own shows, like all 2015 to 2017. My mom would take my hard tickets, would call up everybody like, hey, buy five tickets to this show. Buy 10 tickets to this she show. She love you, man. Man, she do. She, and then she would work my merch table. She would work the merch table. Yeah, my mom worked my merch table for you like got a special mother, three man. years, so I didn't have to pay nobody to work my merch table. That is a special woman, bro. She sold more tickets than almost everybody ever booked. My mom, every how, show. How much did that, you know, did that just, just that gives you strength, and that, give, that gives you the push, man. Yeah, because I know my mom is is real, so... The fact that she's doing that, like I just won her over over time. And it's like some people, they want their parents to give them a bunch of money to get started. But it means a lot more if somebody's willing to like get on the phone and call somebody. Like, I can't give you $10,000, but what I can do, I can call somebody and have them buy uh, 10, $10 tickets. I'm and that's $100 it. that can help you pay or just open an act or pay this DJ or go to the, these venue costs and all of that. Like She's a business lady. She yeah. understands business. Hustling. Yeah, she get, like a real she live get, She get to it. And, um, no, nah, that helped out a, a bunch. Like, that helped out tremendously. And, that, and they saw the light from there. Like, then I just started booking bigger shows. And then from the shows I started throwing for myself and people started seeing I could bring out an audience, then I, people started booking me for different festivals and wow. stuff, and then I started to like make consistent money from music. And then I started working on this uh, project, which ended up being a series called Revolution. And um, Jada was like, man, I need to play this for Paul Rosenberg, who is wow. Eminem's manager and uh, runs wow. Shady Records with Eminem. And because he was about to take over as CEO of Def Jam. Yeah. So he heard like the early versions of this. And I was his first signing during his tenure at Def Jam in 2018. Wow. 
That's and that's crazy. a how did your mom how much that made her proud yeah mm -hmm. both both my parents were super proud because they knew like they knew i was going to do this regardless like if they were supporting it or not supporting it i just believed in it that much but once they saw it with their own eyes and then you see somebody go from the bottom to now i'm at def jam and they were like to the moon what would you moon. tell some of these young kids who <clears throat> feel like they don't have support because a lot of parents will look on rap because there's so much or music there's so much people who have actually failed put their all put their last cent and still haven't gotten anywhere and yeah. as a parent people are like go get you a real job you know this is this gonna break you right you know so what would you tell that child and what would you tell that parent i would say what i would say to the child is you'll get where your parents fear comes from once you have kids of your own Cause you just you want your you work very hard and you want your kids to be able to take care take care of themselves mm -hmm. so when you're in that moment you're like oh they don't believe in me and this this and that but i i look back at it now it's like it's less about me not believing in it i don't understand that world you talking about right i know that people go to school get good grades so they can get, uh, a, good get job. a good job and try to that's because that's what it was for their time mm -hmm. and i can only teach you what i know wow. right you know what i'm saying so it's like you your parents do not owe your you support for your dreams. Mm -hmm. That you gotta accept that. Just take that pill and swallow that pill. They don't owe you that. It's great if you get it, but you're not owed that. I don't have to cheerlead everything, every endeavor that you see. I want you to be healthy. I want you to take care of yourself, but I don't owe you that support if I don't see fit. And if you believe in it, that is your responsibility. You have to be 100% accountable for the material for you to materialize what you visualize I like that, that is a thousand percent on you and then you can possibly win them over or win whatever help you need to win over by people seeing that you are dedicated and this is what you're going to do regardless i had put up so much money i was doing this half a decade before my parents pulled up to a show wow and what do you say to the parent now because that's to the child so what do you say to the parent you have to trust that you've instilled the right principles in them and then cut the apron strings. Like you can't, and it's that's super tough, but that's just what it is. If you see somebody and they're just relentless and they won't stop, you have to trust that you've, you've given them everything that you can as far as information. And then if you see an opportunity where you can support their business in some kind of way or support their endeavors in some kind of way, then by all means, but just if it's an encouraging word, if it's a, sometimes these people just need a hug, for real. Just a hug, like I see you, I love what you're doing, just something, wow. mm -hmm. but just you, articulate that you can still love them even right. if I don't understand this mm -hmm. route that you're going. Man, you know, I I see the uh, the Grammy on the hat, man, and, and um, you know, I, I held both of ice teas when I went to his house <laughs> and interviewed him. Oh, I had crazy. both of them in my hand. I sat there with him. My wife was like, "Man, y'all, you know, this is a big deal." I'm like, you know, you don't see these every day. You yeah. know what I mean? And um, how big was that to to win a <laughs> Grammy? You know what I mean? Like, like that's not something that everybody. That's an elite group, you know, mm -hmm. from Michael Jackson on down. You know, I just yeah. say, like, how big was that? Man, that was um, that's like winning the chip. Like you, you won the chip, you won the championship. It was, um, I was in LA at the time, uh, me and my wife, J-Dot, and, uh, and my wife was in a, a room in this hotel and J-Dot was in another room. And um, we had already won best rap performance. Like er, that was like, they announced that at like the pre-show. Pre-show, yeah, whatever. sure do. So, but the uh, best rap song, that was during the, that's the real shit, like on the, on the, on the action. It's on the show. On the yeah. show. They're yeah, announcing it. They open the envelope, right? Yeah, they, 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 like, they, they nervous. Like the real. Yeah, like, you, you show don't up. know, I and you don't know before they oh, open no, that. Oh, no, you don't know. You okay. don't, you have no idea. So I'm, I'm literally like watching it on TV, wife getting ready, me and Jade out on the phone, and then they like, uh, best rap performance. And we was going against some monsters, so it was, our song, The Savage Remix with Megan Thee Stallion, Beyonce. It was The Box from Roddy Rich. I think uh, rock, rock Star, uh, Roddy Rich and um, The Baby. Mm -hmm. And it's like two other like super huge songs from that year. And um, so he's reading it and he pulling the envelope out and Jay out in my ear, he's like, let's go, let's go. And we just <laughs> still, and I, my body was getting chills like, like I was about to perform or something. Like it really right. felt like that. 
And they was like, Savage Street, man. They was like, what the fuck? <laughs> It was yeah. going crazy. Like we was, I was screaming. Whoever was in the the, the rooms next to me, they heard it. Like it wow. was loud, Damn. loud, loud. Like wow. man, that was like man. I ain't screamed that hard in my life for real. But it, you had a reason to, man. You had a reason to. That that's that's huge, man. It's like a crazy time. That's a different level. Yeah, you understand. Yeah. Like everybody can't say that. Everybody sitting in this seat can't say that. Like. That's that's like going platinum. I tell Duro that all the time. Like it's certain things that yeah. certain artists is OG Bobby Billions uh, platinum. You know, right. like like certain ones that that do certain things. You gotta you gotta give it up, bro. Yeah. These are these are monumental moments in your career. You know what I'm saying? So like I think between you and Ice T and Double A is another one that mm -hmm. won the Grammy. I can't really think of, and I'm probably missing somebody. Don't y'all don't do this. I know I talked to a lot of people, but yeah. I'm just thinking of ones that I can remember because I congratulated Double A. He called me that night. Yeah. Like, he just did that over this last time, you oh, know. That's dope. And Double A is a guy out of uh, he's he living in Atlanta, producer. but he's out. Yeah, he producer, and he and he got songs now. Yeah, he just thought he was producing first, but yeah. uh, then you know I see that's a whole nother level. Icon, like, icon, <laughs> yeah. Like, so like like for you like to write that song for Megan like how did that even happen like when I see Megan you know and some people like how did it did you write it come up with the whole thing or did she come up with parts or how did it even happen? Uh, it's a collaborative effort. I think um, what some people get it's it's so weird like with rap like so with producers they collab all the time like that's just normal you can have two three four producers on one song. But with rap, it gets like kind of weird for whatever reason, which is like it's they, so, it's so. You stupid. wrote it for me, like you know, she. Oh my God, this is the queen of it right here. She come as soon as they come in. Um, did, what did, what's your favorite question to ask people? Um, is did you write it? Is that something that you actually went through? Yeah, did she would ask the ask the and, and some people because the industry is and crazy. I told the people not gonna tell the truth. Some people not gonna tell the truth. Most rappers, almost every single rapper that I've came across, will say. It's their truth. It's everything that they write. That's what they've been through. <laughs> but R and B, this day is totally different. It's somebody else's experience. It's yeah. somebody else's, you know, so forth. But it's just as stigmas. Like they feel like because it's rap, it, it has to be yours. So you that, give us your 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 concept and idea of it. Okay. So with Meg, Meg writes ninety nine point nine 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 percent of her material, as most rappers do. Like okay. even like. Nas can be in the studio and his engineer give a, a idea of for something on a, a hook or some or Jay Z or Kanye on uh, Kanye, Lucifer Malik, down in the sell. morning. I'm gonna chase you. He's like, yo, you should make that a bridge, and then Jay Z does that. So I do the, you know, what I'm saying that's just what it is or whatever. So with Savage, I worked on the my main thing was the hook. Okay. You know what I'm saying, and then Meg did her verses. Mm -hmm. But um, I. Sh I ran into a um, producer um, named Jay White out here in the studio in Dallas. and he Yeah, was, shout out Jay White. That's my guy. Yeah, he was working on something, and um, and uh, we just started, like, he was like, yo, you try, like, writing some songs or whatever. And I had wrote songs for, like, people in Dallas, like, in 2015, 16, 17. Um, but I had, like, stopped doing it for, like, two years or whatever. So I bumped into him. And then uh, came up with this idea for the Savage song. And then uh, she heard it. I met up with her in Miami. She, she had came into the booth and she already had like two verses that she wrote and she memorized. She wasn't reading from a paper or nothing. Like she just wow. was at the Hit Factory in Miami. Yeah, shout out 20. Hit Factory. That's, that's my boy Birdman. Yeah, so she went in there and she, um, she cut the verses, cut the hook, and then... The rest was history. Like mm. that's, wow. that song, uh, song dropped like the first day of, um, well, like that first week that was like COVID. You know what I'm saying like this, this is like some real, some that's real crazy. shit going on. <laughs> and then, uh, and it didn't affect it at all. It in a weird way helped it because since people was at at home, at home, they started doing the dance on TikTok, and then TikTok blew up the original version, mm. and then started getting super crazy, and then Mariah Carey posted it and like a bunch of people just started posting it and started just blowing up from there and then obviously beyonce hopped on it uh it was history and then when that that was another day where like <laughs> when she when dropped that on happened it, you didn't expect that at all it was a wrap nah, nah i got a uh me and zaya uh, we went on a walk 
came back in. I got a missed call from J Dot. I um I call him back. He like, yo, I need your approval. Um, this uh, Beyonce is on the song and it's about to drop like right now. <laughs> I'm like, like I'm when like, did this happen? What? Like I'm like what? what? And they like, yeah, that's approval, quick. right? Yeah, it needs your approval. That was quick though. It was quick. I approved it. I think I was like one of the last ones. The song came out like 30 minutes later. Wow. Dropped. And then it, then it uh, life changed. Mm. Life changed. Life changed, yeah. When, when you say <laughs> life changed, give me an example of some um, of the changes that took place for you. Um, financially was the first. It, it changed drastically. Of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah it, uh, yeah, it changed pretty drastically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you was like, man, I got to do this again. Yeah, yeah. straight up. Because you start, that's where you start learning, like, the power of publishing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, like, what, what, what intellectual property is worth. Very and, much and so. And then you got, like, there's two, there's Savage the Original and then the Remix. And those are two separate, separate properties that right. are both doing millions of streams a day a piece. Exactly. Oh man, it was up. It was up. Yeah. And so, but how 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 uh, much of a struggle? Because that's one thing I've always wondered with artists or producers or anybody in the entertainment industry. When you have a hit and it does so well, to me, I would be stressed because you'd be trying to create another hit so quickly back to back. But it's, yeah. it doesn't always because sometimes you might think it's a hit, but then when you put it out there, it just doesn't take off like you think it would have. Right. So how stressful it is to go in there and recreate something again. I think since I was a, a major label artist for like two and a half years before those songs was going crazy like that, I'm already used to pressure at that point i'm already used to major label expectations at that point but for some people a hit becomes like the worst nightmare mm -hmm. because when it's a same way like the nba and the nfl they say the, the nfl is a copycat league if you see people running certain plays a certain week they start adopting that uh -huh. into their playbook well same with the music business it's a copycat league mm. so if, if somebody find out that you whether it's production or you got some ideas or you have an ear and they worked on this then people start calling literally trying to that was people calling like let's what's this savage like give us something like like this. that and they don't even know what you did or didn't all it right. just gets like real funny and they have certain expectations that they want to be met but there's so many factors outside of the studio that's going to determine if a song is a hit or not like, 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 okay, we all think this song is great, but you can't predict in a studio that a virus is going to spread in the country and everybody's going to be at the house and somebody's going to make a dance on TikTok mm -hmm. and then everybody in the world is going to start doing, you can't predict right. those other elements that's going to make something that a hit. Right. Um, and the studio is one thing, but for it to, it's a, it's a, a element of timing that you just can't predict. That's where the the fortune, God's favor, kicks in. You mentioned Kanye West. We we interviewed Malik Youssef, and I thought about that. He mm -hmm. had because they shared like you know different things. He's a poet, mm -hmm. and he basically shared the times, and he wrote uh, all of the lights and stuff like that. Yeah. You know his input. Yeah, and I think Kanye had, does that as well. Just gives everybody their credibility for being a part of the movement in that studio. Yeah, and uh, and Kanye has some of the greatest albums ever, right? That's right. Because mm -hmm. that's just what it takes. When when Meg won Best Rap Performance, she thanked me in her speech. Wow! Like she thanked us in her uh, in her speech, and um, <laughs> and she's all, she's shown so much love even after that. She hopped on the I'm a King record that we did for the Coming to America movie. The, wow! Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Um, like she's just how did y'all put I'm that together? I'm indebted to her. Um, so I had got, um, I had got an early some early info about the Coming to America film, and they uh, said they wanted a, a song for it. I made I made this record. I sent it off. They loved it. Around like late 2020, I got to see like they gave me some more info on like the scene it was gonna be in. It's like Eddie Murphy. 
Tracy Morgan and uh, I think Arsenio Hall's in the scene and they're trying to get the young, the, the king that's going to take over, get mm -hmm. him ready and prepared for the world that he's going to enter. And this song is the theme song to him finding his swag and wanting to run his, the kingdom his way or whatever. And then... So you have to know about all of that before you create... You don't have to, but it's always best to get some info about what's going on, right. just so you can get the right. You're feel. not throwing the dart in a random direction. I right. wanna, I wanted to hit the bullseye, so I need as much information as possible, so I can make the song that's gonna be um, tailored as best to fit what y'all needs are. Mm -hmm. and, wow. um, so I sent off the record. They loved it. It's like, oh, this gonna be in a movie, and then they was like, what can we do to like take it up another level? And it was like, how do you feel if we put Megan Thee Stallion on it? I'm like. <laughs> you're thinking that's a great when, idea when when you, you did you get to see the movie before it came out no because Ice-T said when I was interviewing him that because that's one leverage you can see the movie if you're doing a song to it yeah. mm -hmm. that they give you the opportunity you can app to say man let me see the movie and I didn't know that you could do that yeah. but he, he no, you definitely can that. I didn't get to see Coming to America before it came out but I had another I had the title track for the movie The Hate You Give okay I saw that movie before. Okay. Yeah, okay. I saw so, that so cause you was making some music too. Yeah. That's whole. Yeah. So yeah. I saw that movie and then made the song and then sent it for the hate you give coming to America. They just gave me details on what the scene was going to be. Okay. So, and that was enough for me. And I, and I think that's the time we was in was so different. Crazy. You know, it, it, that was the COVID, COVID time, time. And I, that was the only big film for me that even came out during that time. Cause I think it was Amazon. Or well, something. The, yeah. movie, the movie yeah. was done. I think that mo was the movie done before COVID, but because of COVID, it, it slowed they, everything they down. Yeah, it slowed everything down. Right. It was supposed to be a theatrical release, and then, um, but all the theatrical releases in the U.S. stopped right. because of COVID. Because of COVID. So Amazon acquired the rights, and it ended up being the um, the biggest streaming week in Amazon Prime mm -hmm, history. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And then, what that, was the first movie that um, you actually wrote? A song for it was the the hate you give that was the that first was the first one, one. Yeah, okay. in 2018 that was the, the hate you one. give the hate you give man we shot the video right in South Dallas at my grandma's house <laughs> oh yeah I had them shoot a like Fox pay to shoot a music video in South Dallas in front of my that's grandma crazy. that's big yeah and, and, and how was how'd your grandma how'd, she loved she it think? she in the video what yeah that's hard <laughs> and, and I, I've interviewed guys that. They put. I think that's so live when you put your grandparents in the in the situation because it basically, you got a memory, man. This yeah. is what this is about a memory for yeah. me. Yeah, you can show your son and be like, "That's, that's your great grandma, grandma. Or, or, right. or your great great grandson mm -hmm. can see it." That's the right. part I love yeah. about it's it. Some real, it's some history. It's real history. Yeah. But what, what did she say? Because, you know, older people, when she actually saw it, what did she say about being in the, in the, in, <laughs> baby? in the video? You know, it's just, it's good, baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> she, she, uh, she scratched the, uh, a lottery ticket while I was doing my verse. She did? Really? Yeah. Did she win? I don't remember if she won. I don't think she won. But she done won in, in life. She's still alive right now. Oh, man. That's my great grandma. She? she 102. Boy, that's big. So, so at the time, she was uh, like that's 98, good. 97, 98. That's, a blessing. Yeah. I, I that's wanna, a blessing. Yeah. That's a blessing. I'm going to get to the music again. I want to talk about uh, Penthouse Prayer with Rick Ross. Yeah. How that all came together. Like, like, because this, this yeah, I've interviewed yeah. a few people that, about three people that got songs. I hadn't interviewed Rick Ross, but he, he did get in the comments. He, he rocked with Boss Talk. So, like, how was it even just working with him? Man. So, so crazy backstory. The first rap album that I ever bought with my own money was the Rick Ross Trilla album. Hey. Um, so that was always just like, again, I'm uh, I'm drawing the people that help, like go get it. And his yeah. music, you just it just feels like luxury. It feels like you hustling and you can <laughs> you can make some of yourself. You know what I'm saying? So we was working on the album Manifest. Was working on it at Westlake Studios. That's where like Michael Jackson recorded and all that. So it's just the energy from the rugs to I don't know. It's just a vibe in there. And uh, I made Manifest in like 10 days, like the whole album in 10 days. And I was wow. just catching a rhythm. And um, so we do the Penthouse Prayers. Penthouse Prayers. Penthouse Prayers record. I put the um, the the verses and then we listen like, this crazy. Like put the hook and then I put the hook on there. And we're like, man, who would be great on this? And it was like, what's the craziest thing we could think of? You know, Rick Ross. Wow. Like, Let's hit him. We hit Rick Ross. He sent that verse back 48 hours later. Mm -hmm. oh, he was on it. Forty eight hours later, he, he agreed to do the video. It. We shot the video in Florida, and it was like, 
a dream come true. I'm like, have Rick Ross on your album intro. Like, come on, man. Rick Ross, man. And I hear that m- 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 Maybach, like the album. Oh, <laughs> yeah. man. Oh, you yeah. do you. Hey, people know now. I'm like, I'm on. It's man. Up. No, that was, blew my mind. Wow. Blew and, my and, mind. And, and hearing it first for the first time, like out and about, just the way the whole thing come together, just in a club setting, people don't realize how much you guys, y'all put so much into it. Yeah. That's a moment within itself. Man. You know what I'm saying? Like crazy. to hear it when the people just look vibing to it. I tell you what's crazy. The first time I heard his verse back in the studio, that was like the peak one. That was it? That was it. How was it? Explain it to me. So um so J Dot had hit me, it's like, yo, I got a I got a surprise for you. I'm like, for real? He like, yeah, so we get to the studio. I would have like Bel Air like every day come in on some like two to three bottles of Bel Air. Our whole thing was champagne and cookies. Like we had like some chocolate, warm chocolate chip cookies and we had a champagne and it was just a normal thing we would do. So I'm pouring the stuff in the flutes. Then he plays the song. I'm like, okay, maybe we just vibing. Then I hear the, oh. like I hear it, I'm like, oh, what is this? Is this? You already knew. And like, I'm a god to me, Mr. I'm like, yo, this is, is this real right now? Like, wow. In the first four bars he does like the, oh. And then, and then the, the, yo, then the drums come in like, Yo, yo, that was it's crazy. priceless, priceless, man. Priceless, priceless. That's one of my favorite rappers ever. 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 Well, ever. you know, well, he ain't the favorite. I, I You know, I'm, me and you differ on the Jay-Z thing, but I'm not going to go that with yeah, you. Yeah, that Jay-Z, Jay-Z is your number one. Yeah, yeah. And I already know that because I, I told my wife, I said, oh, got to go. Bun the same way he loved Jay. I got to interview him. You he know. won the game. I'm not like, saying he didn't win the game, won, but when you old like me, I go back to the like the beginning, so yeah. it's hard on me because I know the who's history. Your, who's your favorite rapper? Well, you gotta think about it. it's phases of favorite rappers. You can't Pimp yeah. C the favorite for all time, period. Yeah. But when I look at the phases of rap, yeah. I look at from you know African Bambada. You you got mm-hmm. you got a bunch of people, bro. You got yeah. Ra- Eric, Eric being Rakim. You cannot yeah. even play with that. I like, open up for they, Rakim. Think about it. Yeah. These guys before that style came, this style we have today was not even thought of, bro. Yeah. So they make they pioneers, bro. Like yeah. you can't. How, how you top that? I understand that. That makes you see. Makes how can you top that? Like. How can you not put them in in everything? You have to because yeah. they didn't. It was it was about the way they delivery was. You never seen music deliver like that before, Rakim man. Ah, for real. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I stop with that, and then I be like, oh, these people tripping yeah. because a lot of times when you uplift others, sometimes it kind of fade away some. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So and that I, is I, unfortunate I just, that that happens. It, but and I be like, dang man, because I remember, I know what it was to come through those doors. Yeah. I remember the LL. LL was solid back then oh, yeah. too, cause it, we didn't have That's nothing like else. That's like favorite rapper or one of them. Well, we just didn't LL, have nothing yeah. else. When yeah. you think about it, you, you wasn't even born probably. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So right. we out here trying to figure it out. But I get it why it is like it is, and I respect the J. Dope business man wise, you can't beat him. Like what a hip hop has done for our entrepreneurs and young brothers, man. Yeah. I never, man. This I would never sweat the technique. It's cold the way it went down, cause he helped yeah. make it go like that. Man, you know what I'm saying? You dropped Reasonable Doubt in 1996. Yeah. And did God did in 2022. It's like, yeah, yeah. that's a long time. It's a long time. To still be nice. No, like no. Like when you look I at the full, it's like, yo, it's, it's this he, man. Crack, same with like LeBron. It's like, you got drafted in 2003. You've playing 20 years later and you're dropping 30. You, I get it, man, there. but I can't talk like that with you because I'm I'm with Jordan. No, I, no, I got you. I, you see what I, I'm saying? Jordan, that's, come on, I man. can't even play with it because I know the explosions and, and the intensity of the game when it was time to make it happen. He, yeah, nobody ever I, dealt with clutch time I, I like just, Jordan. I separate them. I, to me, it's hard. to me, Jordan has the highest peak. Yeah. And LeBron has the best longevity. That's, that makes that's sense. how I look at it. And, and it's okay to respect both of them in their, in yeah. their time. And they don't even that's play the same position. They don't play the basketball the same way. That's or right. Nothing. The yeah. same thing with, with when, you look, when you look at rap. It's the same Absolutely. thing, the time. Because I, I could go on and on about uh, EPMD and all those guys, man. Mm-hmm. And a boogie down production. Like, this stuff was coming heavy and hard. And it wasn't nothing else. Right. Wasn't nothing else, bro. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. you had to go with that. And I respect it because that's what laid the foundation you right. know what i mean we wouldn't be here today without it exactly yeah and that's that's kind of why 
I always bring that up because I'm like, I'm older. I got to make sure I tell the truth. Yeah. You know, my truth. You know, right. it don't mean it is the end all. It ain't right. it's just saying my error have to be spoken about so I can uplift the brothers who basically didn't get to, you know what I mean? That's solid. They, you know, but yeah. at the end of the day, I definitely get it, man. Entrepreneurship in a whole nother level. Drake is doing crazy stuff oh, right man. now, the man. Greatest hit, man. Come on, man. <laughs> Who's your top three artists of all time, dead or alive? Let's go. Any genre. Any genre. <sighs> Only three. Um, Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. That's one of the most. Everybody know Mike is the goat. We might have to retire him, like yeah, you said. We, we go. Yeah. <laughs> Mike you is the, the goat, the man. The thriller and the off the wall track list. Come on, man. like come on, man. It's, Mike it's, it's is the goat. So, There's um, like three goats that we keep getting. Let's see who else you say. The top three artists of all time, dead or alive, any genre. Um, definitely Michael Jackson. I'm gonna say. Uh, Kendrick Lamar. Okay. Are oh, you down with that? We've Kendrick? gotten we've gotten yeah. Kendrick before. Yeah, Kendrick. Yeah. Um, that third spot, tricky. Um, I gotta think on that third one. Man. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that third one, but them two for sure. Uh, if I had to throw somebody, throw somebody. I'm gonna say James Brown. Oh, James Brown is hard. Like what about Brown. Jay? You didn't put Jay in there. But that it's it's weird. It's, it's like all time. <laughs> you're looking at a whole I'm spectrum. At a whole, like artistry. <laughs> like Jay Z is my favorite rapper, and I and rap is art. And uh, but it's totally different. It's tough because yeah, it's, it's different. It's like, the, it's, like the, it's like the um the Venn diagram. It's like there's these two circles, and there's a part where it overlap, and it's the same, mm -hmm. and then it's like some whole other shit. It's the three that everybody always put is your Michael. Your Tupac and your Prince, those three. that makes sense. That makes that's yeah. the ones we get the most on those there. Are, yeah, yeah those that, are that makes three. sense. Let me, let's talk about Black Neighborhood. You and uh, my boy Killer Mike. Killer Mike, yeah. Like how how did that go down and how's he doing these days? Man, so one salute to Killer Mike. Just this this past week, I got a chance to open up for him on that's his uh, Michael tour for the Texas uh, dates in Houston and in, in Dallas. Um, he's always been very supportive of what I was doing, and he was my first big feature when I got into yeah, business, yeah, 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 Killer yeah. Mike. So Black Neighborhood was a song I wrote, um, actually went when I worked at Walmart. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. hard, that's I worked hard. At Walmart, Had they, got the, the they hadn't got the raises yet. Y'all still was going, you know, they bumped the pay up after you left. Man, my pay was like <laughs> eight twenty five. No, they went like. up. They went to 14 and 15, oh, man. Oh, man, see. You missed it. I'm glad I missed it because that, <laughs> that $6 difference might have been too much. That might have been a game changer. I might have been feeling a little cushy back in 2000, you know what I'm saying, 12, 13. But, uh, uh, yeah, mine was eight, so it was a lot easier to quit, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so... I wrote it then and I had like kind of been sitting on it like I was like this song is just crazy because not the song how my verses are that no it's no complete sentences I'm just like naming like different stuff like in a black neighborhood mm -hmm. it's like crackheads smackheads dead bodies course room hospital grandma drug deal gun charge it's like going yeah, in it's just yeah different stuff like that so um Jada heard it was like man we gotta get killer Mike on this like this is this is this is right up his lane right up his alley I'm like, shit, what, what you talking about? Like, let's go and do it. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. he got Killer Mike on it. And Killer Mike, at the time, with uh, Run the Jewels, that, um, you know, the group that he's in, they were opening up for a Lord. Okay. That, that artist Lord um, here in Dallas. And we had just left, like, South by Southwest. So we drove from South by Southwest, came, was at a studio here in Dallas. He came to the studio, got him some weed, rolled up a little bit, and went in the booth, no paper. No pen, and did his verse in front of me. Like it was nothing. It was nothing. It was nothing. It was just I was like, "What the fuck?" Like I heard like Wayne did that and, and Jay did <laughs> you that. You ain't never seen nobody but I do seen it. Killer Mike, like, Black Star, Black Car, Black Same Nigga, Razor, Black With Fist, like, just going in. No pen, no paper, nothing. And then we chopped it up a little bit after, and um. And then I end up just running into him like different times. Like the night I won the Grammy is the night he performed with Lil Baby at the Grammys. Um, I'll keep going. Yeah, like so he I hit J Dot like tell him congrats. He hit J Dot tell me congrats, and and we ain't seen each other in bit in a bit. And then I see him on his tour. He put out arguably the best album of 2023 in rap with this Michael album. Um, and uh, he's in great spirits. Like I see him perform on stage. It was like a revival. Like. It was some, some strong vibes, and I appreciate them giving me the, continuing to give me opportunities. 